Hello, and welcome to the third installment of the Conversations on Substance Use During COVID-19 uh, webinar series. Today, our presentation is going to be a presentation facilitated by two nurse practitioners from the Foundry Virtual Team on overdose response and harm reduction in the context of COVID-19. So this presentation will also be facilitated by myself, um, a youth peer supporter on the Foundry Virtual Team, and a counselor named Laura, who is a clinical counselor on the Foundry Virtual Team. So today you have the option to pose live questions to our presenters um, using the live Q&A function. So you can use that function throughout the presentation to pose a question. And if we have time in the end, we will take questions from the audience. Um, if you have any questions for our guest speakers, and you also have the option to turn on subtitles throughout the presentation um, if you would like uh, written text of what the presenters are sharing. So thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Natasha. Thanks, Paige. Um, so uh, I'm Natasha. I'm a nurse practitioner that's working with Foundry Virtual. And um, this is uh, Kara and I's uh, presentation on overdose response and harm reduction in the context of COVID-19. Um, Next slide, please. So land acknowledgement, um, we would like to gratefully acknowledge that our work occurs on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. Next slide. So the goals for this presentation, um, first of all, is to understand the current landscape related to the opioid crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, um, to discuss harm reduction in the context of COVID-19 and to review overdose response in the community setting so with a focus on opiate overdose awareness, stimulant overdose awareness, alcohol and cannabis harm reduction recommendations. And then there's some resources to go over at the end. Next slide. So to give a bit of a um, overview of the public health crisis uh, for COVID-19. So it's been eight months since BC's provincial health officer declared a public health emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, the data from the BC COVID-19 dashboard as of November 25th um, was 29,086 COVID-19 cases in BC and 371 confirmed deaths. Um, when this first happened back in March, there was great concern that there would be, there would be um, major surges of COVID-19 among substance use uh, populations, namely in the downtown east side. So um, this kind of worry uh, prompted um, the ministry, the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions relied heavily on the uh, BCCDC and the BC Centre for Substance Use to create protocols for substance use in the context of COVID-19 and the needs for people to self-isolate the challenges that that would um, pose. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so a bit of the landscape of the opioid crisis. So uh, April 14th, 2016, BC's provincial health officer declared a public health emergency in response to the rise in drug overdoses and deaths. And the BC coroner service report in August 2020 um, is showing 6,000 people, 6,000 plus people um, have died from a fatal overdose since May 2016. Um, which is the largest death, death toll in a single month since the start of the pandemic was June 2020 with 181 suspected illicit drug toxicity deaths. And uh, in August 2020, 147 suspected um, drug toxicity deaths. So by contrast, in um, August 2019, so a year ago, there was 86. Um, and the toxicology reports confirm an increase in overdose deaths related to extreme fentanyl concentration within the drug supply. And just to kind of show a little bit of the differences, um, uh, in August 2020, it was like a 71% increase in the number of overdose deaths compared to a year ago, um, which is such, such a huge jump. Um, the regions of highest number of deaths were Vancouver, Surrey and Victoria. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to do a slide um, on e reasons that, like, why do young people use substances? So, according to the BC Adolescent Health Survey, so this would have been in 2018, um, uh, the top five reasons that youth use substances were 
to have fun. 65% um, were saying that they were doing it to have a good time. Uh, the other reasons were their friends do it, 33%, experimentation, 28% they, they were using out of curiosity. Uh, stress, so more youth identified, uh, more youth that identified as female cited stress at like 25%, compared to youth that identified as male at 16%. Um, and then another reason was feeling down or sad, so approximately 15% of the time. And then that uh, trend kind of continued. So Females more likely were, were to report feeling down or sad as a reason to use more than males, 21% um, versus 11. Um, and then some more inf infrequently identified reasons, less than 1% of the time. Um, youth reported using substances because of boredom to manage pain, peer pressure, aid studying, or because they were dependent on a substance. Next slide, please. So harm reduction, what is it? Um, harm reduction is an evidence-based client-centered approach that seeks to reduce uh, the health and social harms associated with substance use without necessarily requiring people who use substances from abstaining or stopping. This approach includes programs, services, and practices. Essential to the harm reduction approach is that it provides people who use substances a choice of how they will minimize harms and through a non-judgmental and non-coercive strategies in order to enhance skill and knowledge to live safer and healthier lives. Uh, harm reduction approach also provides an option for substance, use, substance users to engage with peers, uh, medical and social services in a non-judgmental way in order to meet them where they are. This in turn allows for a health-oriented response to substance use, which has proved uh, that those who engage in harm reduction services are likely more likely to engage in ongoing treatment. Next slide. Uh, so some examples of harm reduction, uh, consuming water while drinking alcohol, using a nicotine patch instead of smoking, uh, using substances in a safe environment with trusted peers, supervised consumption programs for people who use substances, drug checking programs, overdose prevention apps, with the overall goal being to prevent the negative consequences of substance use, substance use and improve health outcomes. So, um, and like harm reduction doesn't just apply to substance use, like we use harm reduction all the time, um, with like in to minimize risk in everyday life. So like wearing a helmet when we're biking or uh, a seatbelt in a car. Next slide, please. And then I wanted to contrast um, harm reduction and recovery as well. So what does recovery mean? So by definition, recovery uh, can be defined as a return to a normal state of health, mind or strength. A standard definition of recovery includes ensuring that vital recovery supports and services are available and accessible to all who need and want them. In regards to substance use, recovery is commonly identified as the process of getting better from an illness or returning to a state of physical and mental health or a process of change through which people improve their health and wellness, live self-directed lives and strive to reach their full potential. Um, with recovery, I, I feel like it's important to address that um, it can be tricky to define recovery because everyone's recovery journey is really unique to themselves. Um, and, it, it, you know, one could argue, well, what, what is normal? Um, and so I think in this case, a return to someone's baseline of functioning or their goal of functioning. Next slide, please. So what are some of the contributing factors to increase substance use in the context of COVID-19? And this has been talked about a lot. Um, so feelings of social isolation and loneliness due to physical distancing, uh, increased feelings of anxiety, worry, fear from the pandemic and economic downturn, blurring of daily and weekly routines because of the closing of non-essential workplaces and schools, like gyms are getting shut down, regular activities that we participate in, sports, disappointment about cancellation of recreational events, vacations, loss of things to look forward to, and just grieving the loss of all of these regular things that, that we do. Um, and also increased amounts of alcohol, cannabis, and other substances at home due to stockpiling. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Um, OK, so safer substance use, reducing risk. So ways to use substances in a safer way, so reducing harm. So have a buddy, use with a buddy or at a supervised consumption site. Stagger your use so your buddy can get help. Sorry, I missed a word in there. So your buddy can get help if needed. Um, if you choose to use alone, get a trusted person to check on you or use an overdose prevention app. Start low and glow slow. So test use like test a small amount of your substance first and then go slowly. Use one drug at a time. Using more than one substance increases the risk of overdose. Mixing your drugs, including prescription drugs, with alcohol and other substances is really, really dangerous. Uh, if you do mix, use less than you normally would and go slow. Uh, be aware um, of your health and tolerance. So being sick, run down, having a chronic illness can increase the risk of overdose. Your, your tolerance can be lower if you haven't used for a while. Um, and uh, if you are using a, and or sorry, if you are using a substance for the first time and then also have an overdose plan. So uh, carry naloxone, be prepared if an overdose happens, get training and, and uh, we'll carry your kit. And next slide, please. So common opioids include heroin, fentanyl, oxycodone, codeine, morphine, methadone and hydromorphone. Um, opioids are a type of antidepressant that can slow the body down and make people really sleepy. They can be prescribed or used illegally to produce pain, reduce pain, sorry, manage dependence or produce a state of euphoria and relaxation. Next slide. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about fentanyl because uh, everyone's talking about fentanyl. So why is fentanyl dangerous? Fentanyl is around 20 to 40 times stronger than heroin and 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine, making the risk of overdose much higher. Uh, when fentanyl is combined with other opioids like heroin, morphine, methadone or codeine, uh, alcohol, benzodiazepines, cocaine or methamphetamine, it further um, furthers the risk of overdose. And then combining substances, including alcohol, intentionally or unintentionally increases OD risk. Where is fentanyl coming from? Illicit fentanyl is manufactured in drug labs overseas and in Canada, and it can be cut into powders or pressed into pills prior to being sold. Next slide, please. Where is it found? So fentanyl can be sold as fentanyl, but other illegal drugs also contain it, including heroin, cocaine, oxycodone, crack or meth. It can be in drugs um, that are in powder, liquid or pill form. These drugs can contain toxic contaminants and have different levels of fentanyl in each batch. So even pills produced in the same batch can have little to lethal levels of fentanyl, which is why it's so dangerous because you never know how much, if there is fentanyl in there, you, there's no way to gauge how much um, is in it. So what can you do? Be aware. Um, drugs obtained from anywhere other than a pharmacy might not be what you think it is. Um, or what others believe them to be and have told you what it is. Um, getting your drugs tested is also a really good way to um, reduce harm and uh, share knowledge about risks with others. Next slide, please. So the risk of op opioid overdose is increased when tolerance is lowered after, after a period of non-use or if you're using a substance for the first time. Uh, if you have been sick, tired, run down, dehydrated, or have liver issues or chronic health concerns, um, you mix substances, including alcohol or prescription drugs, or the substance is stronger than what you're used to. So that kind of goes back to our, our harm reduction slide. Um, next slide, please. So naloxone. Uh, naloxone is an antidote to an opioid overdose. It is temporarily reverses life-threatening slowed breathing from an opioid overdose. It does not work for non-opioid overdoses such as uh, like cocaine, ecstasy, GHB or alcohol. Uh, if an overdose involves multiple substances including opioids, naloxone will temporary, temporarily remove the opioid from the equation. It usually acts within three to five minutes and the protective effect lasts for 20 to 90 minutes. Next slide, please. So how naloxone works. 
this picture is pretty cool. So both naloxone and opiates um, bind to the same opioid receptors in the brain, except naloxone binds more tightly to the opioids and knocks them off the receptors, thus restoring breathing, usually within three to five minutes. So this will last for about 20 to 90 minutes. Um, depending on like so 20 to 20 to 19 minutes obviously is a quite a big disparity of time so it depends on the amount of opioids in the system and how fast the person metabolizes it because everyone is is different so during this time your body's breaking down the opiates but that doesn't destroy them so if there's a lot of opioids in your system um or highly toxic drugs like fentanyl long-acting methadone, it, um, it can take multiple doses of naloxone because um, once the naloxone wears off, then those opioids are actually still circulating in your system. Um, so that's the reason why each of the take-home naloxone kits, they contain three doses of naloxone, like three vials. Um, and it's also why it's super important to call 911 at the start of an overdose because um, you don't know how long you're going to have to keep giving naloxone doses. Um, uh, what else do I want to say about that? So naloxone should be stored at room temperature, out of sunlight as it is light sensitive. Don't put it in the fridge. Um, and then periodically check the expiry date. They usually last for about two years. Uh, next slide. So knowing the signs of overdose. So if someone is not responding, person's not moving and can't be woken, um, slow breathing or not breathing at all, a breath, for example, like a breath, one breath every five seconds is a normal uh, rate of breathing. If someone is making sounds, choking, gurgling, snoring, if they have blue lips or nails, cold or clammy skin, or tiny pinpoint pupils. Next slide, please. So know the response. So these are the save me steps. Um, this is really well, uh, this is like really well documented on the Towards the Heart website. So S being stimulate, call the person's name, try and stimulate them with a trapezius pinch. So like pinching like up on their, on their trap muscle or a sternal rub, um, like dragging your knuckles over the sternum of a person. It's a really good way to um, stimulate. If they're unresponsive, call 911 immediately. A stands for airway, tilt their head back and open their airway, check for debris or secretions. V, ventilate using the one-way valve mask, which is in your naloxone kit. Um, and then giving one breath every five seconds. E is for evaluate, evaluate them, are they breathing? Medication is M for medication. So inject one mil of naloxone into a large muscle group. Uh, and keep giving one breath every five seconds. So the, the large muscle group, the easiest muscle to access on a person generally is their, their thigh muscle, um, their quad, and you can also do it like through people's pants. You just do the IM injection through their pants. And E, evaluate and support. Have they responded? Do they need another dose? And keep giving breaths, one breath every five uh, seconds and wait three to five minutes, which is roughly 40 breaths, um, to see if you need to give another dose of naloxone. Um, next slide, please. So um, a note about giving rescue breaths in the context of COVID-19. So when this first, when COVID-19 first happened, um, overdose response was, um, it was a huge stress and anxiety for, for people because it's a respiratory illness. So um, the BCCDC did a lot of work into um, really clarifying that for people and making um, people more comfortable about responding to an overdose in the community. So, and this is, this is what they said. So when responding to an overdose, an opioid overdose, there is a risk of infection, particularly if rescue breaths are given without protective equipment. Um, each naloxone kit contains gloves and a CPR face shield. The risk of infection is low relative to the high risk of brain injury or death during an overdose. So taking basic precautions will minimize the risk of infection of both the person who overdoses and the responder. The face shield has a one-way valve and a large impermeable area which protects the responder from respiratory secretions. After responding, dispose of the face shield before taking off gloves and wash hands. And then if chest compressions are needed, gently place a towel or piece of clothing over the person's nose and mouth. 
Uh, next slide, please. So nasal Narcan. So nasal Narcan is now available for free from pharmacies in Ontario and Quebec and for non-insured health benefits program clients across Canada. So this, this program includes First Nations clients. Administration follows the same principle of intramuscular Narcan, but with some differences. Um, so basically I have a little thing here that kind of shows it. So um, you just place and hold the tip of the nozzle in the nostril until it's fully inserted. So your fingers are actually gonna be touching the base of their nostril and then press the plunger firmly to release the dose into the nose and wait two to three minutes. If there's no response, give a second dose to the opposite nostril and like each each little unit like this is, is one dose. Um, and I've put a link there because there's a really good website that has a YouTube video and all that on administration. Uh, next slide, please. So how to get trained to use an naloxone kit. Um, uh, so towards the heart website, it has a really good um, link to the take home naloxone program. And basically I put the link there and you access the online training. There's really good videos. Um, and then you download print off a certificate of completion and you can either take it to an improved site or pharmacy of your choice and they, then they'll give you a kit and it's free. And then beyond, beyond the certification training towards the heart has tons of resources and videos to demonstrate the use of naloxone and techniques such as how to give rescue breaths. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll move on to stimulant overdose. Um, so stimulants or uppers speed the body up. They include amphetamines, crystal meth, cocaine, MDMA, ecstasy, Ritalin, and caffeine. So some signs to watch for for stimulant overdose are rigid or jerking limbs or seizures, in and out of consciousness, rapid pulse or chest pains, psychological distress, anxiety, paranoia, confusion, panic, hallucinations, agitation. Um, a person's skin might feel hot, they might be sweating or have severe headaches or pulsating headaches uh, or seizure activity. Next slide, please. So stimulant toxicity is a medical emergency. Call 911. There's not an, an antidote to stimulant overdose. So naloxone will not work for a stimulant overdose, but it will also not cause harm. So if you're in doubt, administer naloxone because if your overdose involves a mix of substances, the naloxone will temporarily remove the opioid effects and then activate CPR if uh, there is no pulse. Um, some other things, so if you've called 911 while you're waiting for EMS, stay with the person for support, encourage hydration, stay calm. Uh, don't offer them anything by mouth. And if they're having seizure activity, place them in the recovery, uh, ensure there's nothing around them that can hurt them or put don't put anything in their mouth or restrain them. Uh, next slide, please. So it is possible that if the person is still conscious that they might be experiencing overamping or mental distress. So like crashing, anxiety, paranoia, linked to stimulant use and sleep deprivation. So it's just some things um, that you could respond by doing is staying calm, remaining with them, encourage them not to take any more substances, move away from high stim areas. So like away from activity and noise, give them water and other non-sugary, non-caffeinated beverages to help replace lost electrolytes, but be careful not to overhydrate and place cool wet cloths on the forehead, back of their neck and armpits. Next slide, please. Uh, alcohol overdose. So some of the signs of alcohol overdose. Um, alcohol is the active ingredient in wine or beer or liquor. It is also found in mouthwash, hand sanitizer and other household products. Knowing the signs, breathing, slow or regular breathing, unusual snoring or gurgling breath, consciousness, confused, uncoordinated, unconscious or unresponsive. Uh, some physical signs, uh, turning pale or turning blue, vomiting or seizing. Next slide, please. Um, if someone has passed out or overdosed on alcohol, place the person on their side, like the recovery position, to call 911 or ask others to call. Will you stay with the person? And then, yeah, stay with the person until um, 
EMS arrives. And then the recovery position obviously is going to help um, making sure that that person doesn't choke or aspirate on vomit or any other kinds of um, secretions. Next slide, please. So some examples of harm reduction with alcohol use. Uh, decide in advance how much you'll drink, stick to your limits, drink slowly, <clears throat> alternate between alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks. Don't drink on an empty stomach, eat before and while you're drinking. Do not drink alcohol if you're using other substances as this great, greatly uh, increases the risk of overdose. And I just put a link here to um, Canada's low risk drinking guidelines brochure because it's, it's a really great brochure on um, like what constitutes one drink. And uh, yeah, it's a super user friendly, intuitive um, brochure. So that would be good to check out. Uh, next slide. So cannabis, so some recommendations for um, harm reduction. Uh, every form of cannabis poses risks to your health. The only way to completely avoid these risks is by choosing not to use cannabis. Uh, you'll lower your risk of cannabis related health problems if you choose to start using cannabis later in life. If you do use cannabis, choose low strength products such as those with the lower THC content uh, or a higher ratio of CBD to THC. Don't use synthetic cannabis products. Using these can lead to severe health problems such as seizures, irregular heartbeat, hallucinations, and in rare cases, death. Smoking cannabis, for example, smoking a joint, is the most harmful way of using cannabis because it directly affects your lungs. Next slide, please. If you do choose to smoke cannabis, avoid inhaling deeply or holding your breath. Try to limit your use as much as possible. Cannabis use impairs your ability to drive a car or operate other machinery. Don't engage in these activities after using cannabis or while you're still st or while you still feel affected by cannabis in any way. People with a personal or family history of psychosis or substance use problems in pregnant women should not use cannabis at all. Um, avoid combining any of the risky behaviors described above. Uh, next slide. Please. So this is a bit of a resource, uh, resource page. Um, so the naloxone training, as I mentioned before, um, that link is directly to the take home naloxone uh, training site. And you can also get there if you go to the Towards the Heart website. There's lots of links embedded in that website that get you, gets you to the training. Um, then the, uh, the Towards the Heart website is there as well. That's the BCCDC Harm Reduction Services website. Basically, like the, the source of truth for harm reduction services in BC. Um, there's the Lifeguard app website link there and a little bit on that, the Lifeguard app. So that's basically, it's an app that you can download into your phone. Um, and then, so like when someone is about to use, especially if they're using alone, they can open up the app and record the type of substance they're using and confirm their location. Um, the app will hold this information and a timer is set, which can be paused or extended by the app user at any time. So when the timer ends, the, the app sounds an alarm, flashes the light and vibrates, and the user has to hit like a snooze button on the alarm to indicate they're okay. And then if they're unable to stop the alarm, a text to voice call goes straight to 911 and, and uh, alerts emergency medical dispatch, dispatchers of a possible overdose. Um, so it has the capacity to save someone's life if they become unconscious or unable to function when they're um, using alone. Uh, what else? And then there's a link for the Foundry Substance Use Info and Tools page as well, because there's some really good information on different substances there. Um, and the Apps and Tools page has the link for the Lifeguard app as well. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natasha. That was a really great um, and action-packed uh, presentation. Um, so we're just going to be waiting a little bit um, for some any live Q&A questions from our audience. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask Natasha, um, please feel free to post it at this point. And 
and we can potentially answer some questions. So we'll just have a brief um, pause while we wait for any questions to come in. And also would just like to note that we will be sharing um, all the links that um, Natasha and Kara prepared for this presentation. So we'll be uh, emailing our mailing list um, just to be able to share those links um, with folks after the presentation is finished. So maybe Paige, I'll speak to um, a question. So yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so the, the, the question is, how can I support someone to look at a harm reduction approach when they are pre-contemplative about changing their substance use? And what, what are some things that providers, caregivers and friends can do? So um, some ideas would be like open up a conversation in a calm, non-threatening way to try and dispel the stigma around substance use. Like so non-judgmental, non-threatening approach. Um, using self-motivated statements to help the young person explore their own reasons for using substances, such as um, like what makes you interested in using. Uh, sometimes it can help the young person reflect on, on why they're using substances or why they are wanting to. Um, using open-ended questions with active listening and uh, using affirmations to acknowledge the youth's contribution to the conversation. For example, um, I appreciated you taking the conversation seriously and uh, just becoming knowledgeable about resources and sharing your information with others and being a positive role model. Awesome, thank you so much. It looks like we don't have any other questions, um, but we will send out like Paige said, an email with more of the resources. So if you have any questions, you can always uh, respond to the email as well. Thank you so much, Natasha and Kara, for creating such a wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone for coming. Our next installment of the Substance Use Series will be next Thursday at 4 p.m. on the role of youth peer support workers in the opioid overdose crisis. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Thanks, bye.